say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one accord began to make excuse. As I looked over this morning's gospel and the previous sermons I prepared on the subject, I decided that it was time to look at this portion of scripture in a new light. Rather than simply concentrating on the three excuses that those invited to the banquet gave for not attending, I'm going to focus on three truths that the parable teaches which can be applied to our lives today. Briefly stated, this portion of scripture is about God's offer of salvation and the fate of those who refuse his invitation. So I want to begin by giving you some background information that will help you to understand the parable. And you have to know that in our Lord's day, it was customary to send two invitations to a woman. The first one to announce it, and the second to tell the guest that all things were ready. It is also important to know that in Israel's history as a nation, God's offer of salvation came first from Moses and the prophets, and the second invitation came from his only begotten son. Israel's religious leaders accepted the first invitation by believing through the prophets that God had called them to be his chosen people. But then, later, they insulted God by refusing to accept his son. By way of this parable, we learn that they all began to make excuse for not accepting that invitation. And so the master in the story, which is God, sent his servant into the streets to invite the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind to his banquet. And when the servant reported there was still room, the master sent him back out into the highways and hedges and instructed him, and this is important, to compel them to come in that his house may be filled. That brings me to three truths I believe are revealed for our learning. They are God's invitation to man, man's rejection, and God's command. So to begin in verses 16 and 17, we have God's invitation. The invitation was sent out to inform many, it said he bade many people for the upcoming supper. The initial invitation was accepted by all. The initial invitation called only for an acknowledgement but the second called for a commitment and action. Note that the servant was sent to them that were bidden, those who had already accepted that initial invitation, that being the nation of Israel, believing that they were God's chosen people. They accepted that invitation. The second invitation was that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The second truth then, is that we have man's rejection, in verses 18 to 20. Israel is the prime example, and the intended target of this parable. In John 1.11, it says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They were looking for their Messiah, but when he came, they rejected him. And the third truth is God's command, verses 21 and 23. His command, as stated in the parable, is this, to go out, to bring in, and to compel if necessary. And it's that third truth, that third command that I want to focus on. Going out into the streets and lanes of the city means we must evangelize our community. Doing so by finding those with needs, the poor, the maimed, the, the blind, and the halt. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This command means the church is under orders, marching orders, and that evangelistic activity Inactive, inactive evangelistic activity is in fact disobedience. The command to bring in means God wants 
his house to be full. Our God with his love for souls will never, never settle for his house being half full. 2 Peter 3.9 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The study of God's word indicates that our Lord is clearly not pleased with an empty banquet table, with fishing without catching, with sowing without reaping, a fig tree that bears no figs, lost sheep that are brought into the fold, a lost coin that is sought but not found, or a ripe harvest that is not reaped. For the love of God is so great that it requires a multitude of guests without any empty seats at the table. Now if you think about it, our Lord showed many times that he is very concerned with numbers. Think about this. Hopefully you'll recall some of it from your adult education time. The fish in the miraculous catch were counted. The leftovers after feeding the 5,000 were counted. Converts at Pentecost were counted. And in the power of the lost sheep, the shepherd would never have known that one of his flock of 100 was lost unless he counted them. Luke 14, 23 tells us that the master then told his servants to go out onto the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in. Why? So that his house would be full. God wants a full house at his banquet, and we are to compel those who won't, don't know Christ to come to know Christ, which is the final command. Compel means to entreat or to persuade. If we can convince people that we are really on to something here, which is full of joy and meaning, there'll be a stampede to follow Christ. Therefore, our building ought to be compelling. Ezra 7, 27 says, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such things as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Our worship ought to be compelling. Worship is the language of adoration addressed to God from the heart, the language of the worshiper, and the language of God's instruction equipping us to live and serve Christ. Our fellowship ought to be compelling. John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love for one another. Galatians 5, 14 and 15, For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one another. Here's what's really interesting. People join churches more because they want warmth, believe it or not, initially, than they do light. We like to think that our proclamation of the truth will keep folks in the pews, that sermons may keep them in the church. It may get them there the first time. But what keeps them coming are friendships. In fact, the doctrine may be biblical, the singing inspirational, and the sermon uplifting. But when a visitor finds nobody who cares whether he or she is there, they are not likely to come back. So finally, our witness ought to be, our witness ought to be compelling. From time to time, we hear statistics about people and why they first came and joined the church. Listen to these figures from the Institute of the American Church Growth. 10,000 people were asked about their decision to join a church, a particular church. In other words, what led them there in the first place? And the answers were a special need, 2%. Walked in, 3%. The pastor, believe it or not, is only 6%. Visitation, only 1%.
the Sunday school, 5%, the evangelistic crusade of some sort, 5%, the programs offered, 3%. And listen to this, brethren, friends or relatives, 79%. That's why people come to church in the first place. That's why we have events like Fellowship Sunday, and we've talked about this recently, come in the fall, probably September or so, we're going to have another one of those. It's a time for us to invite our friends, relatives, co-workers, and acquaintances to fill God's house with as many people as we can bring in. It makes sense. If you want your neighbor to know what Christ will do for him, let the neighbor see what Christ has done for you. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. When Christians live the gospel, sinners will listen to the gospel. To me, the parable of the great banquet commands us to reach out to a world in need with the word it needs to hear. We need to realize that Jesus took every opportunity to tell people about his kingdom. We need to realize that the reason he did so was because all people were important to him. That none should perish. And so also, my friends, we should seek out all people at every opportunity to bring them to belief in Christ and the place he has for them in his kingdom. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Loosen our tongues so that we may speak boldly the powerful gospel.